Hello friends, Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to our latest video. In this episode, we bring you the tragic tale of the Highway of Tears. Join me. Let's take a walk and see. Project EPANA is a Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or the RCMP, task force created in 2005 with the purpose of solving cases of missing and murdered Indigenous persons along a section of Highway 16. All the victims were female, between Prince Rupert, British Columbia, and Prince George, British Columbia. This road came to be known as the Highway of Tears. The name for the project, EPANA, was chosen from a combination of E from E Division, which is the RCMP division that has jurisdiction over British Columbia, and Pana, which is the name of an Inuit goddess who cares for souls before heaven or reincarnation. Though it started with the scope of investigating victims of Highway 16, within a year of its formation, it morphed to include victims along Highways 5, 24, and 97. First up, we have Gloria Lavina Moody. Her case is considered unsolved and she's still missing. This was the first EPANA case from the Highway of Tears, reported to have happened on October 25, 1969, when 26 year old mother of two, Gloria Lavina Moody, was last seen by friends and family leaving a bar in Williams Lake, British Columbia, Canada. She had visited several bars that night with her brother, which included the Ranch Hotel, the Maple Leaf, and the Lakeview. The family had been on a road trip at the time of her disappearance. Moody's brother stated that Gloria was right behind him when they left the ranch hotel together, but couldn't recall events after that. Later the next day, October 26, Gloria Lavina Moody's body was found about six miles from Williams Lake on a livestock trail by hunters that were in the area. Moody was found naked, beaten, and assaulted. She died from blood loss due to injuries sustained during the assault. The RCMP took a statement from the family as well as the two hunters that found Moody. During the investigation, three suspects were questioned, and although never arrested, the RCMP stated they were sure the unnamed suspects were responsible for the assault and subsequent death. All three suspects are now deceased, and the case remains officially unsolved. Vanessa Hans, Gloria Moody's daughter, stated, Much of the family and community still suffer the trauma of what happened to our mother. Gloria Lavina Moody's body was found off of Highway 97. She was a First Nations member and the RCMP's first official EPANA case. She was, a, <clears throat> she was a First Nations member and the RCMP's first EPANA case. Officially, Gloria Lavina Moody's case is still unsolved. Anyone that may have a potential lead or tip is encouraged to call 250-392-6211. Gloria Lavina Moody is from the Bella Coola Indian Reserve of the Newhawk Nation in British Columbia. The Newhawk Nation is part of the Coastal Salish people. Next, we have Kayla McKay. On April 13, 2004, 13-year-old Kayla McKay went missing from the Prince Rupert area of British Columbia under mysterious and baffling circumstances. McKay's death was neither ruled by taking her own life nor homicide. Her body was found two days later by the railroad tracks by a waterfront area in Prince Rupert's George Hills Way. Her death was found to be from acute alcohol poisoning, as stated in her autopsy report. Technically, McKay's case does meet the criteria for the EPANA cases, but was curiously not added. McKay's parents continued to inquire about her actual cause of death. If you have any information about the death of Kayla McKay, you're encouraged to call the RCMP Prince Rupert Detachment at 250-624-2136. Lana Derrick. On October 7, 1995, 19-year-old Northwest Community College forestry student Lana Derrick went missing from a gas station on Highway 16 while on her way to visit her sister in the company of two unidentified men. Derrick had gone to school and stopped by her parents' house earlier in the day to drop off her backpack and other school supplies. She met up with a friend for a night out on the town and also spoke with her sister. The two made plans to meet later that night after Derek's sister finished her work shift so that Lana could pick up money her sister owed to her. At around 3.30 that morning, Lana arrived at her sister's house and collected the money. This was the last known sighting of Lana Derek. She wasn't immediately reported missing as family believed she was out with friends. On October 11, 1995, friends and family realized that Lana was missing 
and a small search party was organized to search for the student along the Highway of Tears. The family notified police of the disappearance, but was brushed off as the police didn't take her case seriously. A family member stated that the police assumed Lana was with a boyfriend or out partying with friends. Lana and Derek's family made missing persons posters to place in businesses along Highway 16. This is where the next sighting was reported. A gas station attendant stated that they observed Lana and Derek early on the morning of the 7th in a beat-up car in the company of two rough-looking men. However, this tip couldn't be confirmed as the surveillance tapes had already been taped over from that time period. It was also said that the police were skeptical of the attendant's statement. The police asked for the public's assistance via media, and a sketch artist was brought in to compose drawings of the men from that night. The sketches were released to the public on one of Lana Derrick's missing persons posters. By the end of October, the search for Lana was called off. In 1997, Lana, Derek's aunt, Sally Gibson, offered a $10,000 reward for her niece's known whereabouts. In 2007, Liz Douglas, the investigator handling the Derek case, stated there were still several open leads that were being pursued. One lead was that Lana had been threatened by an ex-boyfriend in the past. It was reported that the ex-boyfriend took his own life the night Lana went missing. There was also a dispute with a neighbor, of which Lana was involved in. Lana Derrick's case is one of the official 18 cases from the EPANA report. She's part of the Get Now, First Nation, and the Get Sand people from Terrace, British Columbia. Lana Derrick's case remains unsolved, and she hasn't been seen or heard from since October 7, 1975. If you have any information on the disappearance of Lana Derrick, you're encouraged to call Valley Pacific Investigations at 866-962-5585. Lana Derrick was described as a First Nations female with brown hair and brown eyes. Her aunt said she believes someone would have a tough time just taking Lana because she was tough. The disappearance of Lana caused a strain on her family members. When asked how the police handled Lana Derrick's case, her aunt Sally Gibson had this to say. Quote, the police helped us the first 72 hours. After that, they told us to return home and wait. If any new leads came up, they would call us. End quote. After seven years, the Derrick family was encouraged to have a memorial for her, but to do so would mean accepting she is gone and they don't think she is, and remain hopeful to this day that she will return. Lana Derrick was reported to be wearing a green cotton sweater, blue jeans, and white tennis shoes when she was last seen. Family and friends described her as shy, goofy, and eager to learn. There was a vigil held for Lana Derrick where her stepfather spoke and had this to say. Quote, we need to give our young people something to grasp onto so they don't go astray. It's better if we can stop these things from happening. Young women need to be aware of their surroundings and don't play with fire when it comes to relationships. The Northwest is a very big country. We get the weirdest people through here. So we have to be watchful and pull together. End quote. This statement was said to be in reference to Atlanta's possible involvement in abusive relationship. One of her other aunts at the vigil described her niece as loving to work outside, lobbying, and all things that went with it. She was really good in her classes. She was really gung-ho about going to college, and she was doing really well. She was happy. Indeed, Lana appeared to have her whole life ahead of her, but now her family has been left in the limbo of not knowing that many of us could not fathom. We can only hope that someday, some conclusion, some solace, some justice comes to Lana and her family. And this person is just one of many who tears have been shed for another life along this tragic highway of tears. Lana Derrick is still missing to this day. Next up, we have Cecilia Nickel. On October 1st, 1989, 18-year-old Cecilia Nickel went missing from Vancouver, British Columbia after having just moved there August of the same year. Nickel had moved to the area to reside with her mother, but left shortly after to reside on the streets. Cecilia was reportedly last seen at Smithers in British Columbia. There was an unofficial report that Nickel had moved to Vancouver Island, but this is thought to be untrue. Nickel is one of the 18 official missing persons on the EPANA report, as is her cousin, Delphine Nickel, that is also missing from the Highway of Tears. If you have any information on the disappearance of Cecilia Nickel or any tips on her whereabouts, you're encouraged to please contact the Vancouver Police Department 
at 604-717-2530. Cecilia Nichol is described as 5 foot 4 inches tall, 128 pounds, black hair and brown eyes, and is a First Nations member. She's known to alternate the spelling of her first name, and it could either be C-I-C-I-L-I-A or C-E-C-I-L-I-A. Next up, we have Cecilia's cousin, Delphine Nichol, that I just mentioned. On June 13, 1990, 15-year-old Delphine Nichol went missing from Smithers, British Columbia, a small town of just over 5,000 on the Highway of Tears. Nichol was last seen hitchhiking on Highway 16 and King Street. She was trying to get home to Telqua, British Columbia. Just a year prior to Delphine Nichols' disappearance, her cousin, whom we mentioned previously, Cecilia Nichol, went missing from the same area. Smithers, B.C. is one of the many small towns on the Highway of Tears that suffers from poverty and lack of resources for its residents. Many people are forced to hitchhike to get from one place to another, making abductions from the area all too common. Delphine Nichol is also one of the original 18 Epana missing indigenous. Delphine Nichol has never been found, and no one has ever been arrested in connection with her disappearance. If you or anyone you know has any information on the disappearance of Delphine Nichol, or any of the circumstances surrounding her case, you're encouraged to please contact the RCMP at 250-847-3233. Delphine Nichol is described as being 5 foot 3 inches tall and weighing 134 pounds. Light brown hair and hazel eyes. Identifying marks are as follows. A right temporal scar, a purple birthmark on her back, and a broken right index finger. Delphine is a First Nations member. Next, we have Alberta Gail Williams. On August 25, 1989, 26-year-old Alberta Gail Williams disappeared from a pub in Prince Rupert, British Columbia, while out with her sister. The two had left work at a seasonal cannery earlier that day and were making plans to go to a house party later that night when she went missing. On September 25, 1989, Williams' body was discovered about 23 miles from Prince Rupert on the Highway of Tears. Alberta Gail Williams had been assaulted and strangled. Claudia Williams, Alberta's sister, stated she is under the assumption that a man killed her sister. An unnamed man that worked at the same cannery facility as Williams and her sister was romantically pursuing Alberta in the weeks before she went missing. Alberta Williams had told the man that she had a boyfriend and wasn't interested in his advances. Now, this person is not an official suspect and has never been questioned by the police. It's unknown how this co-worker reacted to Williams' non-interest in the man's advances. Alberta Gail Williams is one of the 18 original EPANA cases, and there are no new leads in her death. If you or anyone you know has any information on the disappearance or death of Alberta Gail Williams, or any of the circumstances surrounding her case, you're encouraged to call the Vancouver Police Department at 604-717-3321. Next up, Helena Edna Tomat. In 1989, 17-year-old Helena Edna Tomat went missing near Westbrook, British Columbia after she was last seen hitchhiking on Highway 16, the Highway of Tears. In 1991, her skeletonized remains were found and had to be identified through dental records. Along with her remains were the remains of another woman. 34-year-old Elise Friesen was also found in the same area. Both cases remain cold and have no new leads. If you or anyone you know has any information on the disappearance of Alberta Gill Williams or any of the circumstances surrounding her case, please contact the Kelowna Police Department at 250-762-3300. Helena Edna Tomat is described as having brown hair and brown eyes and was a First Nations member. Next, Tanya Lisk. On July 18, 2004, 16-year-old Tanya Lisk went missing from Vernon, British Columbia, while on her way to Calgary. Earlier that day, Liz contacted a friend to let her know what the plans were for that day. That was the last known communication anyone had with her. Through interviews with a friend and family, it's believed that Liz was hitchhiking on Highway 16 when she went missing. Very little information is available in the Tanya Liz case. The criteria set by the RCMP didn't meet the requirements to add Liz to the original 18 cases for the E. Panna Project, even though she was female, a First Nations member, and hitchhiking when last seen. If you or anyone you know has any information, no matter how small or insignificant it may seem, regarding the disappearance of Tanya Lisk or any of the circumstances surrounding her case, again, you're encouraged to call the Mount Vernon RCMP at 250-545-7171.
Tanya Lisk is described as a First Nations member, five foot seven inches tall, with brown hair and brown eyes. Next up, Tamara Chipman. On September 21 of 2005, this 22-year-old mother of a two-year-old son went missing from Prince Rupert, British Columbia, while hitchhiking around the area of Industrial Park. It is unknown if authorities ever searched for Chipman, but her First Nation status led to Morristown Reserve organizing a search. Tamara Chipman is one of the 18 EPANA cases, but little information is available in her case. Because of her background as a sex worker and having a couple of warrants, it's rumored that the police didn't investigate the case as well as they could have. Having warrants would lead the average person to believe that the police would want to find Shipman, if for nothing else, to make sure she's still alive. In interviews given by friends and family, they believe Tamara Chipman is deceased and was dumped around the area of Tweedledee, Tweedledum Lakes. Other witnesses have declined to come forward or comment on the case in fear of, quote, the same thing happening to them, unquote. In an exclusive interview by a family member of Chipman's that wished to remain anonymous, Tamara Chipman was trying to get her life on track for her young son and was giving up her current job as a sex worker to do something better with her life for her and for her son. Chipman is described as a daddy's girl from the day she was born. She had her daddy wrapped around her finger, Tamara's mother said in an interview. Her friends and family love her very much and just want to bring her home either way. They just want closure and more so for her son. Unfortunately, Tamara Chipman's case is all too familiar, where high-risk behaviors are thought to be a part of their life. Their disappearances are sometimes dismissed because of sex work or drugs and alcohol or a combination thereof. These factors tend to dehumanize the individual, and instead of looking past a person's shortcomings, they are defined by them. This is what makes these cases so heartbreaking. With a poverty rate as high as 29%, these circumstances unfortunately force at-risk women and girls to make choices they wouldn't otherwise necessarily make, given better opportunities. Tamara Chipman's parents, John and Corey Chipman, have been searching for her since her disappearance. They've posted flyers at bus stations, truck stops, convenience stores, and other high-traffic areas. The flyer shows a photo of Chipman and has her description. When asked about driving the same highway that their daughter went missing on, Chipman's father said, My mind is always wondering what possibilities could have happened. It's about a 90-mile stretch, and there's really no communities in between. Recalling the last conversation he had with his daughter, John Chipman went on to say, We were in the truck on our way home. And one of the things I remember was her coming over the back seat and grabbing me around the shoulders and telling me that she loved me. The tearful interview given by Tamara Chipman's parents on the documentary Highway of Tears is a stark reminder of a life cut tragically short and a family left to wonder what happened and just where is their daughter. Sitting around the kitchen table with family, Tamara's parents would go through pictures of her younger life. One such picture shows her taking her first steps as a baby in Oscar the Grouch sandals while another shows her as a vibrant 13-year-old. The documentary was the first time Chipman's mother had spoken about her daughter's disappearance. Having also lost her mother around the same time her daughter went missing, Corey Chipman had this to say when asked about searching for her missing daughter. It is too hard. I just couldn't bring myself to go walking along the road, looking in ditches and in creeks and ponds, looking for my child. I just couldn't believe that I should have to do so. Not wanting to get their daughter in any more trouble, Tamara Chipman's parents didn't initially report her missing and searched for her on their own. Tamara Chipman is described as a First Nations female, standing 5 foot 10 inches tall, 130 pounds, with brown hair and brown eyes. Identifying marks are a small freckle beneath her eye, and her hair was cut very short at the time she went missing. She was also known to wear wigs of different colors. Tamara belongs to the First Nations tribe Morristown Band of Wet Sweatin', and this reservation is right off Highway 16. Next, the case of Jean Virginia Sampara. On October 14, 1971, 18-year-old Jean Virginia Sampara was reported missing after having spent the evening with her cousin Alvin. The pair were making their way home when Alvin left Jean on a bridge overlooking the Gitsagukla River to get a jacket due to the temperatures that night. As he returned near the area where they had parted ways, he heard a car door slam, but when he reached the location, Jean was nowhere to be seen. Jean was born into the Gitsan First Nations family and was the second youngest of six children. She attended high school in Hazleton, British Columbia, where she also worked at a local cannery during fishing season. Growing up, Jean was described as shy and quiet, but loved to play nurse with her siblings. 
Jean Virginia Sempar was reported missing by her mother when she didn't return home from the walk she had taken with her cousin. The village in which the family reside helped the family initiate the search for Jean, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police joined a few days later, bringing a search dog with them. An early snow hampered search efforts, but her parents were soon back to searching along with police. The official search lasted for eight days and was called off after the river and surrounding areas were searched in vain. It was reported that the police tried to declare her as deceased and close the case in 1985, but after the family pushed back, her status was changed to missing. Oddly enough, after Jean went missing, her boyfriend was found drowned in the same area of the river where she went missing. Several theories have been researched into the disappearance of Jean. Those include abduction, taking her own life, animal attack, runaway, foul play, a serial killer, or perhaps even friends or family. In all these theories, none make any sense except for a possible abduction by either someone she knew or a stranger. Jean is described as a First Nations female with brown hair and brown eyes. If you or someone you know has any information regarding her disappearance, please contact the Royal Canadian Mounted Police New Hazelton Detachment at 250-842-5244. And now we'd like to present a few solved cases from the Highway of Tears. First up, we have Cynthia Moss. On September 10, 2010, 35 year old Cynthia Moss disappeared from Prince George, British Columbia. Her body was found on October 8, 2010, in Elsie Gun Park near the Highway of Tears. Moss was reported missing by family members when they hadn't heard from her in a few days. Her body was discovered by RCMP Corporal Kent McNeil. Her remains showed defensive wounds, her pants were rolled to her ankles, and she had been decapitated. On November 27, 2010, Cody Allen Legabokov was arrested in connection to the murder of Cynthia Moss, as well as Lauren Dawn Leslie, Jill Stacy Stachinko, and Natasha Lynn Montgomery. Legabokov is one of many zero killers confirmed to have used the Highway of Tears as a hunting ground for vulnerable women. He is also considered one of Canada's youngest serial killers, being just 19 years old when he killed his first victim. Next, we have Kareen Thomas. On July 3, 1976, 21-year-old Kareen Thomas was hitchhiking home on Highway 16 when she was struck and killed by a truck being driven by Richard Medicop. What was first thought to be an accident was later revealed to be a homicide. Richard Medicop saw Thomas on the side of the road and swerved to intentionally hit her. Thomas was pregnant and just days away from giving birth. Sadly, both the mother and child died at the scene. During court proceedings in Redicop's trial, the coroner gave testimony that the fatal motor vehicle accident was just that, an accident. However, witnesses on the scene stated they saw Redicop deliberately swerve to hit the First Nations woman, but after three hours of unsupervised interrogations conducted by the police, it was determined that the witnesses had been coerced into giving a false statement exonerating Redicop of any wrongdoing. They were made to say that Thomas was playing chicken with the truck. With both the statements from eyewitnesses in the coroner, it looked as though Redicop would be found innocent. That was until evidence was uncovered about another, quote, accident, unquote, ten years prior to Kareem Thomas being struck and killed, of another vehicular fatality by Richard Redicop, where he struck and killed a First Nations man on the same road Thomas was killed on. Even though the new evidence pointed to Richard Redekop killing Corrine Thomas intentionally, the Crown never proceeded with the charges to convict him. In June of 1977, Thomas's father sued Richard Redekop for criminal negligence, but the charges were dropped because of insufficient evidence. Both the deaths of Corrine Thomas and the unnamed male that was struck and killed were deemed suspicious, but no further charges were ever pursued against Richard Redekop. Next, Mary Jean Kovacs. On October 10, 1981, 36-year-old Mary Jean Kovacs was last seen at the intersection of Old Caribou Highway and Highway 16. On October 11, 1981, her body was discovered in a ditch filled with water by a man gathering firewood. Kovacs had been shot in the head multiple times by a 22 caliber pistol and dumped at the site. She was the last victim of serial killer Edward Dennis Isaac. Now we have Roswitha Fuschbickler. On November 14, 1981, 14-year-old Roswitha Fuschbickler was reported missing by her father after making plans to meet up with a friend but changing her mind at the last minute to attend a party later that night. 
Fushbickler made it to the party, and after it ended, called a male friend to hang out at his apartment. Two young men offered her a ride, but she refused at first. When the two men asked a second time, she accepted the ride and had them drop her at her male friend's apartment. The two reported watching Fushbickler walking toward the door. This was the last time anyone saw her alive. Rose Witha's body was discovered on November 21, 1981, by joggers in a wooded area in Prince George. Her clothing was discovered nearby. She had been strangled, but had died of a stabbed wound that penetrated her heart. Roswitha Fusbickler was only 14 years old at the time of her death and was the first victim of serial killer Edward Dennis Isaac. Next, Nina Marie Joseph. On August 16, 1982, 15 year old Nina Marie Joseph was found strangled to death by a cord from her own jacket. She had also been stabbed. It was determined that Nina Marie was the second victim of serial killer Edward Dennis Isaac. This potentially would have gone unsolved, but Isaac had his ex-girlfriend help him dispose of the body. The ex-girlfriend would later testify to this, leading to Isaac being convicted of manslaughter and subsequently sentenced to life in prison without parole for 13 years. Next, we have the case of Monica Jack. On May 6, 1978, 12-year-old Monica Jack was reported missing after she didn't return home from riding her bike around the Nicola Ranch area of British Columbia. Her case is a confirmed Epana case, and she is the youngest known victim on the Highway of Tears. Her mother remembers her daughter's sweet laugh and warm smile. Everyone from teachers to acquaintances loved her friendly and sweet nature. A year after she went missing, her bike was found, which prompted a new search for the preteen. However, her body wouldn't be discovered until June 2, 1995, a full 17 years after she went missing. In 2014, Gary Taylor Hamblin was arrested and charged with Monica Jack's murder. During an undercover operation by the RCMP, Hamblin unknowingly confessed the murder to an investigator. In his confession, Hamblin stated he grabbed Jack from a highway pullout, threw her bike in Nicola Lake, shoved her into the bathroom of his camper, where he assaulted, strangled, and disposed of her clothes and body by trying to burn them. He succeeded in burning her clothing, but was only partially able to burn the body. Hanlon's defense was that, quote, he felt his dreams in a close-knit organized crime group could be snatched away, unquote. His defense attorney argued that his client could have got the crime information from a documentary and simply parroted the information, as he could have heard or read about it. On the witness stand, Jack's mother recounted that the last time she saw her daughter was the day she went missing. She was riding her new bike between Merritt and her home when her mother passed her after a trip to the local grocery store. I honked, the mother further stated through a tearful testimony, and I do believe one of the kids yelled out, do you want a ride? But she said no and just kept on going. In another part of her testimony, Jack's mother recalled searching the mountains for her daughter for weeks. Hanlon was found guilty of first-degree murder, which carries a mandatory life sentence with the possibility of parole after 25 years. What the jury didn't hear was that Gary Taylor Hanlon was also being charged with the death of an 11-year-old girl who disappeared under eerily similar circumstances. 11-year-old Catherine Mary Herbert was walking near her home in Matsqui in September of 1975 when she was allegedly abducted, assaulted, and murdered by Hanlon. Her body was found under a piece of plywood months later. Also, in 1969, Hanlon used a knife to threaten a 17-year-old girl and then assaulted her. And again, in 1971, he again used a knife to abduct and assault another victim that was 18 years old. In September of 1978, he abducted and assaulted a 21-year-old female from near Manning Park. He sat silently as his earliest victim addressed the court as to why someone with such a violent and criminal history was out on bail to commit more crimes. He was on probation from a bodily assault when he abducted and killed Monica Jack. It was felt that this was a senseless and preventable crime. Handlin's criminal history also shows flight from a police officer, three counts of unlawful possession of narcotics, and dangerous operation of a motor vehicle. Well, folks, there you have it. The sad, strange tale of the aptly named Highway of Tears. I look forward to your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. Till we meet again, be good to yourselves and each other. Be safe out there. Please don't hitchhike. As for me, I'll see you a little further on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time. Give your animals a hug and tell them I said hi.
strange friends. Before I let you go, I just wanted to let you know that if you love what we do here on Among the Missing, you'll love our partnership with Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Radio is a show I listen to nightly for news, information, and great stories of the unknown. And in the third hour, you'll hear a great story nightly from me as well now. Spaced Out Radio is live seven nights a week. Make sure you head over to their YouTube channel, again that's Spaced Out Radio, and hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, and in the chat, tell them Steve Stockton sent you.